In the Bible story of Job, there is a wealthy man named Job living in an area called Uz with his extended household and vast herds. He is blameless and upright, constantly mindful to live in a righteous manner. Job 1, 1 God mentions Job to Satan, saying, There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. However, Satan contends that Job is only righteous because God has favored him generously. Job 1, 6 to 12. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The Tribulations of Job Job receives four reports in one day, each notifying him that his sheep Servants and ten children have all died as a result of thieving invaders or natural disasters. Job 1, 13 to 22, New International Version. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. When Satan returns to heaven, God gives him another chance to put Job to the test. 
Job is afflicted with horrible skin rashes this time. His wife begs him to denounce God and give up and die, but Job refuses, attempting to endure his afflictions. Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, three of Job's companions, arrive to comfort him, sitting with him in silence for seven days out of respect for his bereavement. On the seventh day, Job speaks, kicking off a dialogue in which each of the four men express their poetic comments on Job's problems. Job 4, 1-21, New International Version Then Eliphaz the Temanite replied, If someone ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? But who can keep from speaking? Think how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. But now trouble comes to you, and you are discouraged. It strikes you, and you are dismayed. Should not your piety be your confidence, and your blameless ways your hope? Consider now, who, being innocent, has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plough evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God they perish. At the blast of his anger they are no more. The lions may roar and growl, yet the teeth of the great lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. A word was secretly brought to me. My ears caught a whisper of it. Amid disquieting dreams in the night, when deep sleep falls on people, fear and trembling seized me and made all my bones shake. A spirit glided past my face, and the hair on my body stood on end. It stopped, but I could not tell what it was. A form stood before my eyes, and I heard a hushed voice. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can even a strong man be more pure than his maker? If God places no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, how much more those who live in houses of clay, whose foundations are in the dust, who are crushed more readily than a moth, between dawn and dusk they are broken to pieces. Unnoticed, they perish forever. Are not the cords of their tent pulled up so that they die without wisdom? Job 5, 1-27, New International Version Call if you will, but who will answer you? To which of the holy ones will you turn? Resentment kills a fool, and envy slays the simple. I myself have seen a fool taking root, but suddenly his house was cursed. His children are far from safety crushed in court without a defender. The hungry consume his harvest, taking it even from among thorns, and the thirsty pant after his wealth. For hardship does not spring from the soil, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. But if I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. He provides rain for the earth. He sends water on the countryside. The lowly he sets on high, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He thwarts the plans of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are swept away. Darkness comes upon them in the daytime. At noon they grope as in the night. He saves the needy from the sword in their mouth, 
he saves them from the clutches of the powerful, so the poor have hope and injustice shuts its mouth. Blessed is the one whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. From six calamities he will rescue you. In seven, no harm will touch you. In famine, he will deliver you from death, and in battle, from the stroke of the sword. You will be protected from the lash of the tongue and need not fear when destruction comes. You will laugh at destruction and famine and need not fear the wild animals. For you will have a covenant with the stones of the field and the wild animals will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock of your property and find nothing missing. You will know that your children will be many and your descendants like the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor, like sheaves gathered in season. We have examined this and it is true. So hear it and apply it to yourself. Job 6, 1 to 30. New International Version. Then Job replied, If only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. No wonder my words have been impetuous. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks in their poison. God's terrors are marshaled against me. Does a wild donkey bray when it has grass, or an ox bellow when it has fodder? Is tasteless food eaten without salt, or is there flavor in the sap of the mallow? I refuse to touch it. Such food makes me ill. Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant what I hope for, that God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut off my life. Then I would still have this consolation, my joy in unrelenting pain, that I had not denied the words of the Holy One. What strength do I have that I should still hope? What prospects that I should be patient? Do I have the strength of stone? Is my flesh bronze? Do I have any power to help myself now that success has been driven from me? Anyone who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. But my brothers are as undependable as intermittent streams, as the streams that overflow when darkened by thawing ice and swollen with melting snow, but that stop flowing in the dry season and in the heat vanish from their channels. Caravans turn aside from their roots. They go off into the wasteland and perish. The caravans of Tamer look for water. The traveling merchants of Sheba look in hope. They are distressed because they had been confident. They arrive there only to be disappointed. Now you too have proved to be of no help. You see something dreadful and are afraid. Have I ever said, give something on my behalf? Pay a ransom for me from your wealth? Deliver me from the hand of the enemy? Rescue me from the clutches of the ruthless? Teach me and I will be quiet. Show me where I have been wrong. How painful are honest words. But what do your arguments prove? Do you mean to correct what I say and treat my desperate words as wind? You would even cast lots for the fatherless and barter away your friend. But now, be so kind as to look at me. Would I lie to your face? Relent, do not be unjust. Reconsider, 
for my integrity is at stake. Is there any wickedness on my lips? Can my mouth not discern malice? Job damns the day he was born, relating life and death to light and darkness. He wishes his birth had been veiled by darkness and wishes he had never been born, feeling that life simply adds to his misery. Eliphaz responds that Job, who has comforted others, now admits that he never truly understood their anguish. Eliphaz decides that Job's suffering must be the result of some sin on Job's part, and he advises Job to seek God's favor. Bildad and Zafar believe that Job must have done ill to cause God's wrath and urge that he should try to be more innocent. Bildad believes Job's children committed their own deaths on themselves. Worse, Zophar implies that whatever transgression Job committed deserved him to suffer even worse than he has. Job contemplates the mystery of God. Job reacts angrily to each of these remarks, becoming so enraged that he refers to his sympathizers as worthless physicians who whitewash their help with lies. Job 13, 4. He wonders why God evaluates individuals based on their actions, since God can just as easily amend or forgive their behavior. Job is perplexed as to how a human may fully meet God's justice because God's ways are mysterious and beyond human comprehension. Furthermore, mankind cannot persuade God with their words. God is not deceived, and Job admits that he does not even know himself well enough to fully present his case before God. Job wishes for someone to arbitrate between himself and God, or else he will be banished to Sheol, the dismal place of the dead. Job believes that there is a witness or a redeemer in heaven who will testify for his integrity. Job 16, 19. Even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high. Job 19, 25. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Job becomes resentful, nervous, and afraid as a result of his ordeal. He laments God's inequity in allowing evil individuals to thrive while he and many other honest people suffer. Job wishes to confront God and protest, but he is unable to do so. He believes that wisdom is hidden from mankind, but he decides to persevere in his quest for wisdom by fearing God and avoiding evil. Job, like his friends, believed that good people are blessed, while bad people suffer but Job was convinced that he had done nothing to deserve his ordeal. He had no notion that his test would have spiritual ramifications, and God kept silent during it all. Job desired to meet God in a trial so that he might demonstrate his integrity. Job 9, 19, New King James Version. If it is a matter of strength, indeed, he is strong. And if of justice, who will appoint my day in court? Instead, Job encountered God during a storm. We cannot tell God when or how he will speak. Job's queries were not going to be answered in the way he expected. Instead, the Lord used the creation textbook to ask Job over 70 questions, which boil down to three major ones. What God taught Job is still applicable today. 1. Who created the universe? Job 38, 1-3 New King James Version The Lord reveals his omnipotence to Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. God instantly informed Job that the time had come to respond to Job's naive questioning of his wisdom. 
Job 38, 4, New King James Version. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. The Lord then began asking Job questions that reveals how great God is and how insignificant Job was. Job 38, 4 to 7, New King James Version. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. God's questions began with the beginning, with the creation of the universe. The origin of the universe is something that has captivated human minds. Yet, the more we understand, the less we truly know. God was saying, Job, you didn't make the universe. I did. You won't be able to answer my inquiries. I will. The portrayal of God's design and creation of the physical universe is exquisite poetry. His scientific statements, on the other hand, are astonishingly correct. Job 38, 7, New King James Version When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So, when we read, When the morning stars sang together, 38, 7. We now know that the stars do sing. They emanate sound waves. Next, God questioned Job about the sea. God had previously compared creation to a structure. Now he compares the creation of the sea to childbirth. The oceans cover around two thirds of the Earth's surface, but they are under the direction of God, their creator. This is further proof of God's majesty and Job's insignificance. Job 38, 8 to 11, New King James Version. Or who shut in the sea with doors, when it burst forth and issued from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it, and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud waves must stop. Then God talked about the morning light, 38, 12 to 21. Even with our scientific achievements and expertise, we still know very little about light and darkness. Job 38, 12 to 21, New King James Version. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on form like clay under a seal, and stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and the upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me, if you know all this, where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? That you may take it to its territory that you may know the paths to its home. Do you know it? Because you were born then, or because the number of your days is great. God's questions about the sea remind us that today we understand that the seas have spring. God knows his creation. Job 38, 16, New King James Version. Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depths? God then inquired about the snow, hail and rain, 
The term treasury can also be translated as arsenal. Job 38, 22 to 30, New King James Version. Have you entered the treasury of snow? Or have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? By what way is light diffused, or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water, or a path for the thunderbolt, to cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven? Who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. In the Bible, we see God employing hail as a weapon. Exodus 9, 13 to 35, New King James Version. The seventh plague, hail. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart, and on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As yet you exalt yourself against my people, in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause very heavy hail to rain down such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and my people and I are wicked. Entreat the Lord, that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, 
I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the head, and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they are late crops. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Joshua 10, 11, New King James Version And it happened, as they fled before Israel, and were on the descent of Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekar, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Today, ecological science reminds us that all natural phenomena are interconnected and vital. But with the other questions, we would be like Job, unable to give an answer. God moved on to the stars. The word bind, 3831, is the Hebrew word for a cluster. Job 38, 31 to 33, New King James Version. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades, or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out Maseroth in its season, or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion over the earth? The universe, including its stars, was created by God speaking. Psalm 147, 4. New King James Version. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. 2. Who controls the universe? God's second question, who controls the universe, began with the animal kingdom. We know who provides food for the animals. Job 38, 39-41. New King James Version. Can you hunt the prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions, when they crouch in their dens, or lurk in their lairs to lie in wait? Who provides food for the raven, when its young ones cry to God, and wander about for lack of food? Luke 12, 24, New King James Version. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? God also oversees the varied gestations among animals. As their creator, he has determined each one. Without a doubt, Job was overwhelmed by God's magnificence and his own smallness by this point. Job 39 1 to 4. New King James Version. God continues to challenge Job. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the mouths that they fulfill? Or do you know the time when they bear young? They bow down. They bring forth their young. They deliver their offspring. Their young ones are healthy. They grow strong with grain. They depart and do not return to them. God then questioned Job about the wild donkey and ox, as well as the mystery of their survival. Job 39, 5-12, New King James Version. Who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the onager? whose home I have made the wilderness, and the barren land his dwelling. He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searches 
after every green thing. Will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed by your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in the furrow with ropes? Or will he plough the valleys behind you? Will you trust him because his strength is great? Or will you leave your labour to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? God then informed Job that he had no claim to magnificent birds such as the ostrich. Job 39, 13-18 New King James Version The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like the kindly stalks? For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain, without concern, because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. When she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. God then spoke about the warhorse, painting a vivid picture of the fearless warhorse charging into battle. Job 39, 19-25, New King James Version Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He pours in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He mocks at fear and is not frightened nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and javelin. He devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet has sounded. At the blast of the trumpet, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and shouting. The hawk and eagle were then highlighted. Who bestowed these incredible abilities on these birds? Job knew he didn't. God did. Job 39, 26-30, New King James Version Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? On the rock it dwells and resides, on the crag of the rock and the stronghold. From there it spies out the prey. Its eyes observe from afar. Its young ones suck up blood. And where the slain are, there it is. The Lord then asked Job whether he still wanted to quarrel with him. Job responded by saying that he had already talked too much. Job 40, 2-5 New King James Version Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Job's response to God Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. 3. Who comprehends the universe? Job 40, 6, New King James Version God's challenge to Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, God questioned Job if he thought he could rule the universe better than he could. Job 40, 8, New King James Version Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Would Job cast doubt on God's judgment? Job had questioned God's justice by claiming his own innocence. Job 31, 36 to 37, New King James Version Surely, 
I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. People frequently discuss what they will say in God's presence. However, as we approach closer to our holy God, we shrink. Isaiah 6, 1-5, New King James Version Isaiah called to be a prophet. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Job 40.10 New King James Version Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, and array yourself with glory and beauty. Job 40.11-14 New King James Version Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in hidden darkness. Then I will also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. God then instructed Job that if he was going to play God, he needed to dress the part and act the part. Was Job capable of filling the position of God? Job 40, 15 to 41, 34, New King James Version. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus tree, in a covert of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it in his eyes or one pierces his nose with a snare. God's power in the Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook, or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose, or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you leash him for your maidens? Will your companions make a banquet of him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. Never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one 
is so fierce that he would dare stir him up? Who then is able to stand against me? Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, or his graceful proportions. Who can remove his outer coat? Who can reproach him with a double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together and cannot be parted. His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes out of his mouth. Strength dwells in his neck, and sorrow dances before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together. They are firm on him and cannot be moved. His heart is as hard as stone, even as hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Because of his crashings, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear dart or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones become like stubble to him. Darts are regarded as straw. He laughs at the threat of javelins. His undersides are like sharp potsherds. He spreads pointed marks in the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He leaves a shining wake behind him. One would think the deep had white hair. On earth there is nothing like him, which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. God then accomplished the most incredible thing. He emphasized two of his works. The first was Behemoth, which was most likely a hippopotamus. Job 41, 1, New King James Version. God's power in the Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? The following was Leviathan, possibly a crocodile. The crocodile is one of the most vicious animals in the animal realm. In contrast to the alligator, which will not attack until provoked, a crocodile will actively seek humans. God proved by his inquiries that these animals were beyond human control. Job knew he couldn't battle these animals, but he was eager to fight their creator. God taught Job and continues to educate us who is truly in control through these questions concerning who created the cosmos, who controls the universe, and who comprehends the universe. We are far better off putting our faith in this all-powerful and loving God.